Hola. Uh, uh, me habla poquito español. Uh, Audrey, español, pretty good. <laughs> uh, no, uh, no hablamos uh, mucho español, uh, pero um, uh, uh, oh, es, hoy esta es la última charla uh, uh, después a uh, Choripanela. <laughs> What's a shame is I have no idea why you clapped. <laughs> what, why okay. did they clap? Oh, uh, because of the chori panela. Ah, okay. Um, okay, so let's let's get started. Uh, we are Daniel Greenfeld and and Audrey Roy Greenfeld. And I am a, an engineer on the architecture team at Eventbrite. The Ventios guys right there, are my coworkers, um, they're awesome. Um, and I am an engineer also and a principal at Cartwheel Web. So we met at PyCon US in 2010, uh, and we were married last year in December. So yay, we're married. <laughs> so so uh, PyCon uh, means a lot to us, and it it means so much to us to to be here today. It's it's um, you know we are, we just have so much of a love for the Python community. And we are big fans of steak and red wine. So <laughs> we are so happy here. You might know us from some of our open source work. You want to? Yes, and Python community work. Um, so uh, we, oh, so I, I was one of the uh, co founders of Pi Ladies, and I currently lead the Inland Empire Pi Ladies chapter. Um, and and we also have done two scoops of Django. We we started PyCon Philippines, uh, the Bar Camp Django thing, which is starting to take off in various user groups. And we also do open source, a lot of it. Yeah, so we um, we have created so many open source packages that, that we, we don't have time to go through all of them. But you can go to um, GitHub and look up PyDanny or AudreyR and, um, and find all of our repos. Yeah, and some of them, yeah, we're behind on pull requests. We'll, we'll get to it. <laughs> um, so the question is, is why do we do so much open source work? And we're going to discuss that a bit today. We've, we've benefited. It's been good for us. It certainly has given us, oops, given us a lot of career opportunities, jobs, and also, um, it once we get into a job because we're able to use open source we're not buying linux we're not buying postgres or mysql so it's been really good for our professional work and um and you know with with all of this that we receive from from free and open source software um it's we feel that it's our responsibility to give back so that's that's one of the reasons we've written so many different libraries but there's another reason, which is ego-driven. <laughs> uh, it's the download count game. Uh, this is for one of our packages on the Python package index. Sometimes what we do, um, don't tell anyone, is we go and we refresh the page and look at the download count in, you know, increasing from day to day. And it's kind of similar to uh, if you create a website and you and you um, you you have your Google Analytics and you're constantly checking, did somebody visit my site? Did somebody visit? And and um, we we are guilty of of um, you know that motivating us. <laughs> <laughs> so you know we do this by putting our code up on the Python package index and. Uh, this is, you know, what we all use to search and find for Python libraries. Um, you know, there's tons of stuff. There's, I guess, 50,000 or 60,000. So there's generally whatever you need is going to be on there. Who, who here is familiar with it? Okay, good, everyone. Let's ask another question. Who here has released a package on the Python package index? Raise your hand. That is actually really good. Argentina rocks. Yeah, we, um we we asked the same question at uh, PyCon Australia a few years ago, and and there were fewer hands. So so I'm I'm so proud of all of you. This is awesome. 
But we feel that everyone in this room who's doing Python should at some point um, release, create and release something on the Python package index. Um, uh, and uh, some of you might think you are um, not experienced enough or, you know, that you've never, if you've never contributed to open source, you might think, oh, maybe I should start by, you know, writing a little patch for something else. Or you might even, or you might even think that some of the authors of, of these famous Python libraries, maybe, maybe they're experts, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, you might feel not good enough. And I, and I, um, remember feeling that way before I ever released a Python package. But you see, there's this big secret about it. Uh, and the secret is that the people who release stuff on the Python package index, they're not special. They're not, um, gods of Django or something silly, or, or of Python <laughs> or something silly like that. What they are, they're, they're like everybody in this room, from beginner to the most advanced person. They are just people. They're just people who write software. And the difference is between people who put stuff on the Python package index and people who don't is whether or not they do it. it it's <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's just a matter of, of uploading. Now, um, a package... Um, doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, a package can even be as simple as as just a single function. So if you can write def and the function name, and um, and then the body of the function. Yeah, you you get you get a, an installable package that, or you can turn that into an installable package that you can put on the Python package index, and then like us, you can watch the download count go up and up. <laughs> Um, but you might ask, isn't this hard? Um, you know, isn't there like some kind of special magic? And, and really there isn't any magic involved. Um, you, you know, th what the bullets say is that once you get the boilerplate down for the package and then you add the code, then you can put it up on the Python package index. And if you can write a function, you can create, you can get your stuff on the Python package index. It's, it's as easy as that. Um, and I'm, I'm the author of a uh, very uh, well-known library called Cookie Cutter, which makes Python packaging very easy, and it, it generates the boilerplate, uh, just all of the, a, a package contains all of this, all of these files, and then your own stuff, all of the files and things, you know, you can um, consider them standard for every package, and um, uh, this, this tool helps. We'll, I'll, I'll tell more about it later. But, you know, what's nice about being able to create a package of a single function is you get these small but useful packages, like binary or not, which can determine whether or not a file is binary on no matter what operating system is, is one that Audrey created. And one that I created is cache property, which extracts the um, cache property decorator from Django, Flask, Bottle, whatever, but includes a thread safe version. And um, these are little things that you can use outside of frameworks. And um, these these two are are examples of, of packages that you can look up if you want to see an example of a very simple package, one that only has a few functions. But of course, go ahead. Um, you know, you can of course take a complex project, like if you have a bunch of scripts, and you can turn it into installable packages, like say um, this one, Django, or Matplotlib if you're into that kind of stuff, uh, or IPython, you know, Fernando Perez's pet project, and of course, Cookie Cutter has gotten pretty sophisticated. And um, complex projects like those in Cookie Cutter often start out as very simple projects. So, so um, Cookie Cutter started out as just, um, I think it was three files with with a, a few functions in them, very very simple. And now it's it's so sophisticated that I don't understand many of the pull requests. <laughs> So, so what should you build? If you haven't put something on the Python package index, what should you be creating? 
And the answer to that is something that you need. If you have a, a script that you copy and paste from package to project, from job to job, stop doing that. That's copy paste coding, except for it's, you know, you're, you're hiding the fact that you're doing it. Instead, put it up on the Python package, package index and get more eyes on it. And the community might follow. You might get 1,000 or 20,000 followers like Kenneth Wrights did with requests, or you could end up with five or six or one. Um, but, but don't worry about that. That's not important. Um, what you need to do is, is focus on your needs, and we're going to tell a story about it. Um, so the story of uh, binary or not, which we mentioned, um, it so it's currently just a package that has only four functions in it, and it, it tests whether a file is a binary or a regular text file. So it, it, it doesn't know for sure. There's no actually good way to know 100%, so it, it um, guesses, and it's based... It's based on a, a very similar uh, software package in Perl. And um, this, this is the code from the package minus, um, minus the comments. It's, it's only 20 lines of code. And um, you know, this seems small. It was even smaller at first. It, it was originally only two lines. And it was such a small package that when I, when I released it, um, one of the uh, Debian packaging people uh, made fun of this package on a mailing list and said it was oh it's kind of kind of a stupid package you can you can uh, you know you can just write t two lines of code but you know but this is enough that that when I look at this I don't I don't um, I don't understand um, at a glance what it what um, what exactly is in there but I don't have to because it's it's in a package and um, this this is on on GitHub. It only has seven stars, and two of those stars are are me and Danny. So so it you know with only five real stars, you you know maybe maybe no one's maybe no one has any idea that exi it exists until today. Um, but um, but actually, just yesterday, I received this this email from someone who said. Uh, hey Audrey, just found today this lib and wanted to say thanks for sharing it. It fit my needs perfectly. Big fan of how you went about it. And this was just out of nowhere. I mean, this is a real email. So, um, and this alone justifies that I that I created a package for it. Just the fact that e if even one person uses uses your package, that's that's a hundred percent more users, right? Um, because it's not just me, it's, I mean, I guess Danny too, so maybe. <laughs> um. So don't be super ambitious. You don't have to try to solve the world's problems. You don't need to, you know, create a CMS unless that's what you really want to do. Instead, identify small problems and fix them because they're going to grow. There are going to be edge cases. There's going to be someone on Windows who needs your stuff, right? Or maybe it works on Mac but not Linux. Who knows? Um, so we're going to tell some stories about it. Um, first up is Django Uniform and Django Crispy Forms. Who here uses these libraries? OK, a good number. So I don't know if you know this, but I started Django Uniform at NASA in 2009. And yeah, working at NASA was awesome. Uh, <laughs> and I get everywhere I go, I get questions of why did you leave NASA? And that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I bet. <laughs> so okay, so the reason behind it was uh, I started my first professional Django work at NASA. I've been doing Python for a few years since you know I guess 2005, 2006. But in 2009, I got to do Django professionally instead of as a hobby. And every US government project has to be Section 508 compliant. And if you've done any work in accessibility, you know that Django is not Section 508 compliant, which is awful. What's, what's Section 508? OK, so Audrey wants to know what Section 508 is. OK, so if you're colorblind, 7% um, of this audience, the, the male side of this audience, will not be able to read, will not be able to tell that there's two different colors up there because they're colorblind. So there's, there might be someone in this room. Raise your hand if you can't. Okay, we're not going to ask this question. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things is having your work have enough contrast so that way you can, you can see 
how it works. And this applies to websites, to airplane controls, everything you can imagine. There's also for the blind. Can you read that? <laughs> um, that's a really bad joke. No. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. Okay. Um, there are screen readers on, on, for websites, which will read the content of the site and the controls. And unfortunately, Django's, you know, the way that we're taught originally with Django is, oh, use, um, when you have define your tables in, or your forms inside your templates, you do uh, form dot as table, right? Well, that doesn't work too well with screen readers. It, it, it throws them off. And so the, the rule that we had at NASA which isn't quite 508, but it's close enough to, to make it qualify, is that forms, HTML forms, must be defined not in tables, but in divs. So my project had 80 forms. And converting all of those by hand, I would have gone crazy. And I didn't want to do all that work because like a good software writer, I'm lazy. I'm as lazy as I can get away with. So I wrote my very first template tag in Django, and it's awesome. What's really awesome is the inline HTML. Um, <laughs> so I know if, people, if I put these slides online, people are going to make fun of that. Uh, but what I did, what was neat, is with the assistance of Yanis Lytle. Uh, everyone know who Yanis is? Uh, Jez does? OK, he works on PIP um, and Django and a bunch of other things. Um, I packaged it up, and I put it on the Python package index. Once I did that, I started to get feature requests to the API. They wanted more than just that filter. They wanted to have entire HTML form generation via the, these controls inside this library. And once you have generate entire form, you need the ability to render functions. To say in Python, hey, I want functions at the, I want buttons at this place. And once you get buttons, you need layout controls, which meant we needed to allow people to put in divs and all kinds of magic. And yeah, the project got bigger and bigger and more complex. The code was kind of mungy. And then there is the form set problem. Uh, Django has a thing where you can do forms and sets, and I hate it. I, I don't like it. A lot of people love it. For some reason, Eastern Europeans, or Europeans in general, love this feature of Django. Um, I don't like it. Um, I think it adds too much complexity. And people were submitting pull requests for it, and I didn't want to deal with it, so I ignored it, and I didn't even respond. And in fact, this one guy, Miguel Araujo, uh, from Spain, um, called me out on it, and I gave him a nasty response. Unfortunately, Audrey said, Danny, be nice. <laughs> and um, and so he, he worked in form sets, and we started to work together. We really liked each other. And eventually, I handled him to him the lead of the project, because he really liked that that workspace, the, the form controls. And so once we did that, at that point, Twitter Bootstrap was coming into play. And Django Uniform referred to another HTML CSS library. And we wanted to rename it. And Audrey came up with the idea to honor uh, Bruno Rennie of Django Floppy Forms. We would call it Django Crispy Forms. So that's the story. Um, Django Uniform, don't use it anymore because it's deprecated. And, um, whoops, um, there we go. Uh, and what's been raised in the past couple of years is with the front end revolution of JavaScript and CSS, you know, and, and all these frameworks for it, is, is there a future for it, for form controls in the Python? And, and I don't know. Uh, a few years ago, Twitter went to rendering everything in the front end, and then they pulled back from it because they discovered, yeah, there can be performance issues. So it's this ongoing story. The project still has life and legs. A lot of people use it. But it started out as a tiny little um, untested script. And you know that's, that's what's neat about it is your projects, once you put them out there, they'll grow. All right, next story. Okay. Um, the next story is is about uh, Django Packages, which is a, a website that um, it's a directory of uh, reusable apps for your Django projects, and and it's it's not just an index, but it it has uh, comparison grids. So so here are um, different. It, it's a compare. This this page is a comparison of different cookie cutter templates, and you can. If you scroll down on the page, you can see you can see the um, just different categories that are that those are being compared against.
Okay, there we go. All right, um, so it started off in Django Dash 2010, and we had this great idea for a pro Everyone knows what Django Dash is. It's kind of like Rails Rumble, but for Django. Uh, we had this idea. We're going to have automatic birthday greetings for Facebook, which I thought was awesome. And yeah, it was this. I mean, this was we were trying to come up with an idea for the you know Jang, it's like an open source project competition, and we we realized that this uh, our birthday greeting idea for Facebook was was probably kind of stupid, um, and um, the big problem we had was that we were going to implement it, and then we were too lazy to learn the Facebook API, um, and you know we we had we had to start the contest the next day so we thought okay we'll come up with another idea and our idea the second idea was what about making comparison grids for django packages and what we did is we looked at this is actually still in the django wiki it's a comparison table of different cms's and this is how people used to try to establish what what's the best CMS for Django. And there used to be one for blogs and co and what maybe th they're starting one on comments, but it's really hard to maintain. Two or three of them. Yeah, there's yeah. two or three of them. And what we did is we wanted something where anyone could add a package and then add it to a grid. Once we got the grid working, we added stretch goals where anyone could add a package, anyone could add a package to a grid, and fetch data from GitHub and PyPI. And this has become the go-to tool for the Django community to research and discover packages. And it was built over a weekend. It was something that we needed. There was nothing out there like it at the time that, that allowed any user to add content. And what we did is we focused on our needs. And so the same thing goes for your projects. Don't build something you, that you think other people like. Build something that you would like, that you want, that you need. So um, on to the next story, um, which will be about cookie cutter a bit more. Um, I, I started it in the summer of 2013. Um, I, at the time, I was, um, I was experimenting with just creating as many packages as I could, just, just for fun. I wanted, on, on GitHub, there's a, there's a calendar of, um, of how many commits you've done every day, and I decided to start filling up all of the green boxes and and just you know just creating creating stuff and I wanted I, I I don't know I thought I'd make some packages um, and I found that after I was making um, several Python packages I was I was copying and pasting um, the same boilerplate files from project to project and so cookie cutter was just created because I I, I was getting sick of of doing that. Um, and here's a sample of the boilerplate that's pretty common. You need the Travis CI file, the Python module, um, how to contribute, your PyPI boilerplate, tests, um, all this setup, all these files, the manifest, the setup.config. No one can remember this stuff. Even the guys who, who write the systems that do this stuff, they have trouble remembering it, and they argue about it's how it's supposed to be used. So this is, this is actually a hard problem. And um, at the time, uh, the project I had I had made before to fill in my GitHub calendar was was to create a. I, I wrote a static site generator. Um, it was called Complexity. It's kind of a, a bad name, but I I um, I you know I was doing this thing with generating um, HTML from Jinja two templates, and I thought you know if I'm generating HTML files, it's kind of similar to generate other files, you know, the, the whole idea of, of um, taking a directory of templates and, and um, running them all through um, the Jinja 2 rendering process to generate your output files, it's, it's kind of similar. So that's, that's how the idea of cookie cutter came about. And um, and I it was kind of a toy project. I was just playing around. I thought I thought oh maybe nobody nobody will want will really want to use this project because because it's um, you know it's so easy to use Jinja too that maybe this project shouldn't even exist. But after after the first release, I started getting pull requests, and they just kept coming and coming. And I I um. I didn't know why I was getting them. I mean, I guess it just the project resonated with 
with people a lot and I was I was at the point where I was I was spending all my free time you know every day after work the whole weekend you know Friday night instead of going out for um, you know to the movies with Danny we were we were working on cookie cutter and and it was so it had so much momentum that I was I was the trending developer on github not just for the day or the week but for the whole month and and I I beat Mozilla, so um, Eric, uh, who's giving the keynote tomorrow, will, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so beating out everyone in the Rails core team. Emilio used to be in, in the Rails core team, so yeah, a lot of people are using it. And I, I, I didn't really want to be up there. It was kind of embarrassing and overwhelming, and... And then, um, and then Danny embarrassed me further <laughs> by, because he, he, he was so excited that he, he blogged about it. And then he, you know, when he blogs, he gets very serious. So he needed an image for the blog post. So just, I threw together, like, in five minutes. It's, it's, it's a terrible logo, but, <laughs> but, um, so that's kind of how it, it all came about. Um, and, um, so with open source, sometimes it's just this sudden fire hose of interest, and you just you just have no idea that it's going to happen. And um, this is Cookie Cutter Pi package, which is which is a, a template for creating a Python package. Okay. Would you like to me to give a quick demo of Cookie Cutter? Raise your hand. No. Okay. And okay, hold on. And you can. Okay, and um, Danny is um, is now a core developer of Cookie Cutter, and he he is so awesome. And I and you know being being married to another core developer on your project is really the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have this really simple function called Upper. Um, I I invented it uh, like five minutes before this talk, uh, and I want to release it as a package on the Python package index, because who knows what pull requests I'll get, or I just want to be able to install it, because I keep using this everywhere in my code, in all my projects. So I've got this code, and you can hold on. OK, so um, okay. My prompt, my prompt is too big. Can you see this, the prompt at the bottom? OK, all I do, because I've, I've pip installed it, um, it's, you know, to install it, it's just pip install cookie cutter. And you can do sudo app get cookie cutter brew install. It's going to be out there on um, Condus pretty soon, so for the scientists in the room. Um, so I just type cookie cutter, and I'm going to type github.com. OK. And then slash, I have a cookie cutter template, which is designed for simple modules like this. And module, I think that's right. OK. So the first thing it says, you know, can I, can I overrate what you ha have cached? And then, uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh. So I think that I have it, I have, uh, let me do. OK. So you know this is real because I had an error. Um, okay, so I can also pull from local repos. This is a, a clone of what I, I try to pull off of GitHub, and hopefully. Okay, so here at the bottom, it asks. Um, so ignore the error. Yeah, ignore the error. We're, we're working now. So at the bottom, it says module name, and it says the. There we go. And so I'm going to call this upper, or uh, I'll call it upper 60. And then that's my name because it has intelligent defaults. My email, uh, my GitHub username because it's it's going to render a lot of stuff for me. A short description, uh, upper key thing package. Okay. Release date is uh, we're okay. Fourteen. I'm going to try and do it the the Argentine way. So eleven fourteen. Uh, one four, <laughs> and then I'm not going to worry about console script. It'll figure out the console script, and this one will actually set up Windows tests if you want to do continuous integration for Windows. 
Um, there's Travis CI equivalents for Windows, but I'm not going to worry about that because I'm on a Mac. And now, if I, in my directory, the third one down is upper 60. And. So, um. Oops. You know. Yeah, so it cloned the project template and then it used, it, 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 it asked him questions and then generated the files based on the answers that he provided. Actually, this is hard to use, so I have a, a, a mock-up locally, but if you want me to show you afterwards, I can. So I'm just going to... Okay, so um, because it's hard to... What I'm seeing here is not there. So, But what it did, and, if, and I can show you after this talk, is it created all this boilerplate. And for example, in setup.py, it puts in my name, my email address, all this useful stuff. And um, even the... the because we're using Jinja 2, even in the file and directory names, that means that that's named, you know, um, it, it'll be named upper 60 throughout the project. What's really interesting is that um, Java guys showed us that they do this. They actually put business logic in the directory and template names because it's Jinja 2, um, which is kind of crazy. But um, yeah, so it's pretty awesome. And it creates all the boilerplate. And what's great about this is in minutes, you have everything figured out. And a lot of companies and, and organizations use it. OpenStack, anytime you start a new OpenStack repo, you have to use um, some cookie cutter templates that they that, that are powered by this tool to, to create stuff. Um, and we use it at, at Eventbrite. What? Yeah, w w yeah. Um, so we're gonna skip the PyPI demo because I'm not sure about the internet, but I was just gonna show you how in two commands now that I've done this, I can get my package up on the Python package index. So it's really easy, you know, with a tool like Cookie Cutter and a little bit of knowledge that we put into the templates once it's rendered to just, you don't have an excuse not to do it. Yeah, so so um, now with Cookie Cutter, I mean, uh, yeah, it, it, it takes minutes to create and submit a package to the Python package index. And um, so one thing that some people worry about, because we get some grumbling, it's like, oh, if it's too easy, then there's going to be more packages on the Python package index. And I'm not going to know how to find them. I, I, you know, how do I look through all these 50,000 packages? You know, what, you know, I can't find what I need. And if you say that you are either A, a beginner and just not sure how these things work, or B, <laughs> you, you might be a bit cranky and grumpy. Um, and, um, you know, it's, this is kind of the, the typical problem that, you know, if you, um, if you don't know how to, um, if you don't have good search and you, and you're, you don't know how to, how to, um, you know, search the Python package index or Google or Stack Overflow intelligently, you might, you might worry there's too many packages, but th it's the same argument for, like, when the, when the World Wide Web was, was in its, um, in its earlier days when, um, when there was GeoCities, people would complain that, oh, it's too easy to make a website, that, um, that, oh, the web's, the web is just, um, you know, all going bad because because all these all these um, dumb people are making websites and now now with um, with Google it's not really a problem that there's that there's so many billions of websites um, because we've got good search. Um, the other thing is people who kind of complain about this they don't do their homework they don't read blogs or books to find out what other people are doing or new discoveries uh, and they're they're not attending great user groups like the ones you have in Argentina which put together this event so you know yeah you kind of have to look around and be nice about it and it's really important to remember that the more the more packages that exist the better off we all are because when we have more packages it means we have a greater diversity of selection um, you know the rules of Darwin also apply to code, and more importantly, is different. There's different viewpoints on the same problem. How I think about things is different than how Audrey does, and the way we think about things coming from North America will be absolutely different than how you think about things here in Argentina. 
for example, if Django doesn't meet your needs, then you should use something else. Here's a bunch of lists of things. And in fact, the ones that are bolded, Flask, Pyramid, and Web2Py, or writing your own, were, were arguably created, and I've heard the founders say this, um, by people who wanted alternatives. Armin, you know, didn't like Django's heavyweightness. Um, uh, Chris McDonough of Pyramid wanted, like Django, but wanted to do his things his own way. And, yeah, more modular. Yeah, separate libraries. And Massimo of Web2Py wanted, you know, a more a heavier stack so you could do more things more quickly. And it's not just Django, of course. If you're, if you're doing anything with APIs or the web, if, if you don't want to use URL lib or URL lib 2, there's requests. There's URL lib 3 that powers it. There's PyCurl, which just wraps curl. And there's, and there's lots more. And um, even something as commonplace as the Python shell, um, you know, um, IPython was was um, created by Fernando Perez. It was his it was his first Python project, and it was just a 259 line script. Um, and you know, what's what's just so interesting and great about about um, other uh, programmers in the Python community, what I've found is that we're very open to critical thinking and um, and just being unafraid to roll up our sleeves and try implementing something better or something different, not necessarily better. Um, IPython is, is now a huge project. It's 180k plus lines of code um, and it's, it's really amazing. So with more packages, we get more options and more diversity. And there, yeah, diversity is, is good. Do you wanna? Okay. So it's, it's often better to write a new library than to be limited by what exists. If, if, um, NumPy doesn't do what you want, then you write pandas to extend it, right? Instead of just scripting things out. I mean, uh, you, you will want to try and use stuff, but if you hit walls, you know, just don't be afraid to, to write things. How, may I ask, how much time do we have left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Oh my god. We need to hurry up. Okay, so we'll speak quickly. Um, we're going to share with you the story of matplotlib uh, pretty quickly. Uh, who here has used matplotlib? Raise your hand. So um, matplotlib was the first library that I that I used in in Python. I I went to MIT and um, and we were using MATLAB and Mat matplotlib. And I I didn't even realize that I was writing Python. I I just thought I was using a tool that was like MATLAB that was called matplotlib. And um, you know if if not for this, I might not have ever um, gotten into Python. Um, it was by John Hunter, who who very sadly passed away in 2012. Um, so it was it was his brainchild, and his his work is just so so widespread and so influential um, to to everyone. Uh, you can oh uh, yeah, you can read more about it. Um, we'll we'll have the slides up. Um, and the story was that it was um, created to to solve a, a major problem for children with epilepsy. That children, some children, don't respond well to medication, and and so they have to have um, brain surgery. So so the way that they do it is they they open they stop the the child's medications. They open up the brain and they they put electrodes on to um, gather data during seizures and they have to figure out which part of the brain has the seizure activity so they can remove the remove that part and um at the time uh uh John Hunter was working in this lab and this is this is the old software that he was using which um which just had a i guess an overlay of the activity on on the video of the brain and and um and it was a very expensive tool that was um it was it was very proprietary so so the licensing was enforced by by a dongle so the lab had many different patients and only one dongle to um to do this analysis and and you had to have the dongle plugged into your your computer in order to run this so it was 
Yeah. Hopefully no one would leave that at home because then patients could die. Yeah, so it was um, very limiting. And, um, and, so, and he thought he could build something better. And so he, these are some actual early screenshots of, um, of, of tools that he, that he wrote. Um, and, and this is a tool to, to uh, localize where the electrodes are located. Um, co-registering with the CAT scans. Um, and then here's one with full integration of MRIs. And you can see this is, this is a much better picture than what we saw earlier in the very first slide. And then on the left is the predecessor to MATLAB. Um, sorry, Matt Putlin. <laughs> um, uh, which is plotting and analyzing the seizure data with electrodes um, so that way they can create a 3D location. They can trace the 3D location in the brain and this is the final result so that way they can you know precisely go and remove that part of the brain. So um, yeah, it, it, it changed people's lives. And um, you know he was so generous he originally offered that plotting part, the, the, the second to last screenshot, as as a patch to IPython for Fernando Perez and um, Fernando, you know, he loved he loved the work, but he was he was drowning in work with his graduate thesis, and so he needed a few months to finish. And they, you know, they emailed back and forth and became very good friends. And John, um, you know, John asked him, "Hey, do you mind if I release this as as a library?" And Fernando said, "Sure, why not?" And and that became Matplotlib. So um, you really never know what will grow from a small piece of FOSS code. So, you know, certainly there's lots of projects out there. You should contribute to them. Um, if, if they're minor fixes or enhancements, that's what pull requests are for, especially if they fit the project's needs or goals. But watch out for spikes. Uh, a spike is when as a pull request, you basically rewrite the whole project. It's it's kind of rude <laughs> um, when somebody comes in and basically rebuilds your house from scratch because you might not know what they're trying to do. Um, and instead, consider forking or starting your own project. It's OK. You're going to get complaints about not invented heroisms, but sometimes you just got to do it. Otherwise, we'd still be on PHP, right? Um, <laughs> or on um, Fortran. So, and start a new project if, if there's nothing out there that does what you need um, or you've tried other things uh, and that it, you feel that'll empower you, that you won't be have to deal with someone else's structure or architecture or rules. You want to just go and do it yourself. That's okay. And so we've covered diversity of, of, oops, of tools, of implementations, of approaches, and now we're going to cover people. So um, a, part, a central part of the Python community is that we love diversity. And I, um, I just wanted to do a quick, you know, cheers for, for PyLadies Argentina. It's, I've, I've, just, I've been following the tweets, and, um, and it's, it's just it's really, it's really exciting. And, and also Django Girls Argentina. Um, so, and I encourage everyone to, um, to support Ariana's work that it's, it's, it's really amazing to, um, to come here, you know, halfway across the globe and, and see, and see the, the same, the same enthusiasm for diversity. Um, so I was one of the founders of PyLadies and, uh, it started because after a long conversation at PyCon 2011, um, we, we, we kind of, you know, talked about the idea. We we're kind of shy, and and Anna Martelli Ravenscroft, who is one of one of my heroes, she is the co-author of of the Python Cookbook. She she said, just do it. She she just, you know, she said to just go for it. And we knew we couldn't do it alone, so we asked for help from, you know, seven seven women in LA, and and three guys helped us get it going. And um, Pilady. Uh, now I run Inland Empire PyLadies, but I, I, um, it's kind of in partnership with, with Inland Empire, uh, Python users group that it's, it's not, it's not like a segregated group, but rather it's kind of like additional support for, for the, um, the women, uh, in my area who, who want to get deeper into Python and, and who, and who might 
need extra support. But we all go together to Inland Empire Python users group, and and it's it's um so yeah, and and a PyLadies chapter. It's kind of just like a study group or a Python user group. Their PyLadies is decentralized, like Python user groups, so anyone can organize it. Um, just and you just have to do it. And there's a there's a kit for PyLadies for starting a chapter. Um, that there. Um, so sometimes groups, diversity groups like PyLadies, run into interference. A lot of people are like, "Oh, why are you doing this? This is stupid." And we're going to explain in a few slides why it's really important. And there's this is an incident involving PyLadies in Bangalore, India, where a a member, a leading member of the Python Software Foundation of India, was doing some really unpleasant things to to the PyLadies organization, and it was resolved. But but he didn't understand what we're going to show you in a few slides. It was it was resolved. It was resolved, but the the PyLadies Bangalore chapter ended up dying. Um, and so, you know, yeah, support support your chapters. Or um, if you don't necessarily, uh, if PyLadies is not your thing, there's also um, there's a Boston Python workshop template for creating workshops for women. And there's also a PyStar. Um, curriculum. Uh, so, if you know, PyStar is another way to to do women's outreach. Um, and you know, diversity is not just about women. Um, like, for example, uh, we can be a bit self-critical um, because you know we met at PyCon US. We love PyCon US. Uh, sometimes it's called PyCon North America, but there's there's 23 countries in North America. So why why is it called that and it's always just in the U.S. or in Canada. Um, uh, we we don't really we don't really know. It's know. also always in English. And it's always in English. Um, so it's um, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> we're we're, we're um, it's it's good to be self-critical and examine things like this. So. Um, the other thing is there needs to be more recognition of of free and open source software leaders and contributors from South America. Um, the Django Software Foundation, for example, until a few last week, had one member who might, I believe is here. Ramiro, is, are you here? OK. Um, there's one, one person from South America who's in the Django Software Foundation. And there's like 50 of us in it. So it, it's in that change, we doubled it by adding Aniki Bastos of Brazil. So we doubled it. Um, but <laughs> But it's kind of silly. Um, the, the thing is, is people from Canada, the United States, and Western Europe, we've got it made. Um, we, we control the Python Software Foundation. We're the ones who determine how much gets distributed to Python user groups in, in Argentina, for example. And, and we don't really think that's entirely fair. And the other problem is, is if you're not white and male and speak English with a US accent it's 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 go ahead click the next one um, it's it's harder for you to be taken more seriously if you if you look or sound different I've got it made but I mean not not necessarily always but I've I've uh, I've I've personally uh, encountered that sometimes and and so but you know we're all trying to get better about about these things and so that's why you know there's also the Python diversity mailing list and um, yeah, you, anyone can join the Python so Software Foundation. It's it's free, and um, and I encourage everyone to to join so that you can speak up. And and yeah, I mentioned the mailing list. Um, you can blog about what can be improved, and and you can also start other initiatives uh, for diversity. So you don't necessarily have to just be content with the current ones. So like for example. You know, PyLadies, you can you can fork it to make whatever you want. Like you know, like these these don't exist, but um, but you know, you could start a pi gay, lesbian, bi, trans group, or or you know, uh, PyLadies of color because um, you know, intersectionality is a a, a big issue. Or you know, uh, maybe for our daughters, a pi girls, or for our parents of high seniors, um, there, there's just, there's so many things 
you can do. And um, like for example, in Singapore they had lady pie. It's not pie ladies, but it's 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 you know they made it their own thing. And and also um, in Canada there's ladies learning code, which was started by a, a woman I met named Heather who attended the first pie ladies workshop in Los Angeles, but she she um, she thought she wasn't happy with just Python. She wanted to do something more general and and do a lot of uh, a lot of JavaScript and HTML. So she started this, and and you can you know you can you can start start anything you want. Yeah, well, we're almost done. So why why do you care? Why does this matter, especially to yeah to to a lot of people in this room? And the reason why it's an investment. If you help the diversity movement, you are paving the way for the future. And and we're gonna I'm gonna explain why. Um, do you want to speak this way? Okay, I'll I'll go. So in uh, in 2010, I attended PyCon US because I saw they had a a program of you know discounted tickets for women, and and I that was the only reason it caught my eye. I had never. I, you know, I was doing some Python, but I never thought, oh, I, I'll go to a, a Python conference across the country. Um, and if I hadn't gotten that grant, you know, in an alternate universe, um, maybe I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have occurred to me to attend PyCon US back then. And if I, if I hadn't gone, um, you might not know our Python community work. So, so the things that we were in deeply involved in in creating or co-creating would would be gone. So imagine if all that was gone and it was just our local user groups. Um, you also might not know our open source work. So all these all these packages, um, you know, some of them are Python, some are JavaScript, some are CSS. Um, you you wouldn't. You know, most of them wouldn't exist, or I guess the ones that are crossed out are the ones that I was creator or co-creator of, and the ones that are left are are the ones that um, that Danny created. Yeah, and so but even those, even those, um, so that leaves us with Django WYSIWYG and Django Crispy forms. And if Audrey hadn't told me that one day you should be nicer to Miguel Arajo, then it, Django Uniform slash Django Crispy forms would die. So all that would be left would be me in this thing called Django WYSIWYG, which I haven't touched in years. So yeah, a lot of stuff would be over. Yeah, so, so anyone can start a Python diversity initiative. Anyone can start a, a user group, Python, PyLadies, whatever user group. Um, anyone can can um, take their code and and package it, you know, create it, release it. All you have to do is just is just do it, and um, you know, don't don't worry about what what people think. Just just get into it with a good heart and and with the desire to to you know release it and have fun. Um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>